Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Durst Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of APA and chair of the New Urbanism Division, and I am your webcast moderator. Today is Friday, June 24th, and we will be hearing the presentation, The State of Sustainability Programs in the Northeast. For technical help during today's webcast, you can type your questions in the chat box found in the webcast toolbar to the right of your screen, or you can call the 1-800 number that you see in bold. And for your content questions related to the presentation, you can type those into the questions box, which is located in your webinar toolbar to the right of your screen. And we will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. And I ask that you, when you're asking your question, that you please include uh, the, the panelists that you would like to answer it. Coming up on your screen is a list of the sponsoring chapters and divisions for 2016. Thanks to all the participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible and free to their members. Today in particular, this session is sponsored by the New York Upstate chapter of APA, and you can learn more about them and their programming at nyupstateplanning.org. So thanks to them. Coming up on your screen is a list of our upcoming webcasts, and you can register for these by visiting our webcast webpage at ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. To log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, just head over to planning.org and log into your My APA account. And then you can uh, select to search for CM activities either by the event number or the title of today's webcast, which both of those can be found, again, on our webcast webpage at ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. And this webcast has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing only. We do have a few recorded webcasts that are available for distance education, and you can check those out at ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. And like us on Facebook, Planning Webcast Series, to receive up-to-date information on our uh, upcoming sessions. And we are recording today's webcast, and it will be available on our YouTube channel. You can just search Planning Webcast on YouTube and a PDF of the presentation will also be available on our webcast webpage uh, probably by Monday. Again, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. Okay, with that, um, I am going to verbally turn it over to uh, Joanna Netto. She's the Director of Community Programs at Audubon International and APA Sustainability Champion. And uh, she is going to kick us off an introduction and introduce our panelists and get us rolling. So, Joanna, it's all you. Great. Thanks so much, Christine. Um, yeah, so thanks to APA, thanks to the Upstate New York chapter and to the Sustainable Communities Division for making today possible. Um, I actually, we need to take a moment to remember Art Buckley, who um, unfortunately passed away a few months ago and is very missed, and was uh, the one who helped us get the regional sustainability network going and set up this webinar for us on behalf of Upstate New York APA. Um, I am serving as one of the sustainability champions for the APA Sustainable Communities Division. And um, I work out of New York State, but um, in that role I've been trying to include all those in the Northeast, in New England, um, and been working with another champion, Angela Vincent, to try to bring together planners in the region who are interested in sustainability topics and networking. And so this webinar came out of that, um, that effort. Um, I'm going to give just a couple announcements from the Sustainable Communities Division. The um, APA National is accepting volunteers to develop questions for an update of the comprehensive planning exam for the AICP exam, um, and they're looking for subject matter experts to help write new questions. So if you're interested and you want to volunteer to work on a team, you'll be trained and given guidelines and you can get CM credit. Um, contact me or contact David Fields. Um, also, the division is accepting proposals uh, already, surprisingly, for uh, the national conference for their by right and facilitated discussions. 
uh, which will be in New York next May. And so you can apply through the APA website through July 29th. And then um, I just want to also highlight the July 15th webcast, uh, which was listed on the previous slide, our division webinar, uh, which was very popular. It was based on a session that was very popular at the National Conference um, in Phoenix last year on regenerative ur urbanism. So um, join us for that if you missed it or if you want to see it again. So on to today's topic. Um, I have the great honor of gathering this really exciting panel, um, and I'll turn the stage for the conversation. Just to give you some background, my day job is working as the Director of Community Programs at Audubon International, and I oversee the Sustainable Communities Program, where we provide assistance to municipalities, towns, counties, in incorporating sustainability into planning and all aspects of the community. And that program um, involves wildlife habitat and open space, recreation, water, energy, transportation, and so much more. And it culminates in communities getting certification for their sustainability planning and accomplishments. And in that work, I often see that it's a challenge for local governments to take comprehensive, a long-term look at their community, to think about sustainability and try to transform you know, how they do business, how they have their policies written in the programs that they do. Um, and so today you're going to hear about some state and regional data sources that have been developed, some planning initiatives and some tools that have been created to help local governments plan for sustainable futures. Um, we're hoping that this webinar will kickstart the conversation within our region about these issues in the Northeast, but really, you know, nationally we want to move the needle on bringing sustainability into every community. And so we're hoping this will help folks anywhere in thinking about um, sustainability in planning. Um, all the programs you're going to hear about today take their own unique approach to sustainability or resilience or quality of life, um, whatever you want to call it. We're talking about confronting the challenges of natural resources that are limited and frequently being depleted, um, air and water pollution, habitat loss, health problems and disparities, water systems, transportation systems, and climate change, and so much more, um, and how we use technology and policies um, that seek to balance human life with environmental health. So um, the panelists we'll be hearing from, we're going to start uh, with New Hampshire. We'll be hearing from Jennifer Sizz, who is the Assistant Director at the National Regional Planning Commission. We'll then move on to New York, where we'll hear from Dazzle Ekblad, who is the Climate Policy Analyst at the Office of Climate Change in the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, based in Albany. We'll then hear from Alicia Hunt, who is the Director of Energy and Environment in the City of Medford, Massachusetts. And we'll wrap up hearing from Donna Drews, who's the co-director of the Sustainability Institute at the College of New Jersey. And we'll hear about their experiences with sustainability in each of those states. So um, I'll go ahead now and hand it over to uh, Jennifer Sizz. OK, thank you, Joanna. Granite State Future was a HUD 2011 Sustainable Communities Regional Planning Grant. All nine regional planning commissions in New Hampshire jointly applied for a single grant with the objective of strengthening our individual work through collaboration and producing resources to support local, regional, and state planning. Simultaneously, in an, in an intentionally connected effort, New Hampshire Housing, through a HUD Sustainable Communities Challenge Grant, offered small grants, um, small municipal grants to implement livability through the local regulatory framework. Our two efforts were established recognizing that New Hampshire as a state does not fund local planning. The planning commissions focused on providing research and data for communities and New Hampshire housing examples of implementation. Focusing on the regional planning process, Granite State Future included outreach to over 12,000 New Hampshire residents through nearly 600 events and outreach opportunities to ultimately develop nine independent regional plans and a statewide snapshot. New, Hampshire, our, New Hampshire's RPCs are charged under state statute with two responsibilities, to create a comprehensive development plan for the region and to conduct a housing needs assessment. 
The RPCs worked in partnership with their communities and many other organizations across the state, including 12 different state agencies, 17 nonprofits, seven different programs at the University of New Hampshire. And at the local and regional level, the, region, the regional planning commissions and their staff were supported by more than 340 people from communities and regional organizations participating in regional plan development committees. As mentioned, the Regional Comprehensive Plan is one of the RPC's statutorily mandated obligations. There is an intentional framework of coordination between state, regional, and local master plans in our state statutes. All three follow common elements for planned components. As regional planning commissions, we are often the conduit for communications between the state and municipalities. The New Hampshire Livability Principles represent a merger of the New Hampshire Smart Growth Principles, the Federal Partnerships Livability Principles, and common elements from local master plans. They were generated by an ad hoc roundtable hosted by the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation looking to implement the transportation and land use elements of the state's climate change action plan. These provided a framework for us and an opportunity to look across the traditional planning silos and explore the interrelationships of housing choices, economic vitality, transportation choices, natural resources um, in this update of the regional plan. We conducted our work in three phases, beginning with statewide outreach and resource development, moving into regional plan development, and then pulling it back together at the end to create a statewide snapshot. During that first phase uh, of statewide research, we conducted our collaborative outreach. We produced a regional plan framework, a statewide existing conditions and trends assessment, climate change studies, um, as well as developed a series of common planning metrics. And this was all in conjunction with um, the writing of our nine regional plans and the statewide snapshot. A big lesson learned early in the process was that outreach was essential to overcoming political opposition. In our case, the word sustainability was polarizing, uh, and the there was a fear of federal funding, top-down planning initiatives, or even the loss of local control. So we allowed our timeline to shift to allow greater time for the outreach process, delaying regional plan writing from our original timeline. Statewide outreach focused on cost sharing, and our local and regional outreach strove to not reinvent the wheel from region to region. We developed a broad mix of products and engagement techniques to help reach as many people as possible from all segments of our populations. The regional plan framework used research compiled by our statewide committees and provided a high-level outline for all nine regional plans and a list of resources and statewide policies that already existed in New Hampshire. The framework presented the information by traditional plan chapter and cross-referenced by livability principle. The goal was to break down silos and think from the perspective of any given livability principle. Additionally, the framework was designed to be helpful for local master planning, enabling plans to build from a common foundation at all jurisdictional levels. And similarly, we compiled all inputs into a single report out of existing conditions and trends that presents key data points and considerations for each of the livability principles. Sustainability and resiliency took many forms, from natural resource protection to maintaining infrastructure that supports our economy to renewable energy and climate change. The statewide existing conditions report provided the larger context, big picture look at trends affecting municipalities, regions, and the state alike. The climate change in southern and northern New Hampshire reports were prepared by Climate Solutions New England out of the University of New Hampshire. The reports present historic and projected regional climate change data for the state along with strategies to help New Hampshire communities adapt to and mitigate impacts. The reports build off of climate change data from municipal stations and provides detailed information for those communities across the state to understand local and regional trends. 
Additionally, we developed a set of common planning metrics to support each plan chapter. We selected metrics most critical to telling each of our regional stories, but of also mutual benefit to state and local planning. The intent was to provide a tool for our municipalities to be able to reuse beyond our regional planning process that would be helpful um, when faced with limited resources available to update their own plans. The data is provided online for download in um, Excel files as well as we produce a GIS data viewer. Each region developed its own unique regional plan built on a common foundation and having had the benefit of the collected statewide research. All regions agreed to a common set of content, but each chose to organize those elements differently. Um, plans included discussions of visions and goals, um, regional story, uh, implementation, housing, transportation, water infrastructure, environment, economic development, climate change, energy efficiency. They also included a needs assessment and conducted scenario planning. To maintain independence critical to political success, <coughs> each region was able to focus on developing those portions of their plan that were unique to their locale, build upon local master plans, and collaborate with local officials and organizations. The primary objective was to provide decision makers a concise story of what citizens and communities in each region value, what they want for the future, and their ideas for getting there. Success stories are featured throughout each of the regional plans, and so selected Granite State success stories were carried forward into the statewide snapshot. Each, fo each focuses on a different area of the state and presents a local case study of how municipalities, regions, transit agencies, and other organizations are already impl implementing the goals of the regional plan. A couple examples, um, the town of Claremont, New Hampshire, was once a declining old mill town. Downtown Claremont today bustles with new restaurants and residences, renovated river mills, and welcoming storefronts. Bohannon Farm in Hopkinton thanks to a broad coalition and partnerships across governmental and nonprofit sectors, um, will be preserved for future gener generations. And elevated sea levels are a rising priority on the seacoast. Determined to take action, 19 organizations currently collaborate as part of the New Hampshire Coastal Adaptation Workgroup, helping seacoast communities prepare for the effects of extreme weather events. We took the work from all nine regional plans plus statewide outreach and research in combination to draft a statewide snapshot that highlights themes, trends, issues, regional commonalities and distinctions, and opportunities for the future. Several trends and issues were repeatedly referenced, including resiliency, collaboration, demographic shifts, and equity. New Hampshire's, um, oh, sorry, the snapshot presented its findings by livability principles. New Hampshire's diversity of communities represent one of the state's defining features and its cherished assets. Across the state, residents want to keep traditional New Hampshire landscape intact by focusing development in town centers and village areas, while simultaneously keeping open rural areas for agriculture, recreation, and other suitable uses. The snapshot also looks at unique challenges for both urban and rural areas. For example, um, maintaining water and transportation infrastructure for urban areas versus a greater emphasis on private wells, gaps in broadband coverage, and more limited transportation options in rural areas. Housing choices ensure that everyone, no matter their income level, enjoys convenient and affordable residential choices wherever they choose to live. Our abundance of large single-family homes in New Hampshire is poorly aligned with projected demand as a result of changing demographics and consumer preferences. Flexible regulations can help communities respond better to market demands. And statewide, residents expressed an interest in a mix of housing choices. But there was no consensus on the type of living environment um, that folks prefer. 50% of residents 
preferred mixed-use walkable neighborhoods to the other half preferring to live in exclusively residential areas. Transportation choices provide a number of options to help people safely and efficiently get where they need to go. New Hampshire residents depend significantly on automobiles to meet their basic needs. Approximately 9 in 10 Granite Cedars drive to work alone or carpool, and while maintaining highways and bridges is a top priority for, for transportation funding, state residents voice broad support for investment in more transportation options. And our lack of transportation options is seen as an economic liability. Our high quality of life is frequently cited as a key economic strength. However, high utility costs and difficulty in retaining skilled younger workers are potential barriers to economic growth. As a state, we need to encourage financial investments to attract and retain economic opportunities that foster community growth and ensure the highest quality of life for New Hampshire residents. We need to focus on education and workforce development, infrastructure, and the containment of business costs as a priority moving forward. Our natural resources, functions, and qualities require that we protect New Hampshire's beautiful natural landscape and wide diversity of wildlife species for the benefit of future generations. Additionally, New Hampshire residents stated that environmental protection is their number one priority for investing public dollars. And top priorities include mitigating stormwater impacts, preventing water pollution, and maintaining our state's cherished agricultural heritage. Climate change and energy efficiency section identifies opportunities to save energy and costs and reduce risks to our communities, businesses, and citizens. A volatile utility costs and climate change represent emerging threats to sustainability in New Hampshire. Um, significant change in key climate indicators over the last 100 years and extreme weather events impact infrastructure planning and emergency preparedness and fossil fuels represent more than half our energy consumption and emissions. If we improve energy efficiency and invest in renewable sources, we can reduce both health and environmental impacts, as well as reduce volatility in our electric rates. So bringing, bringing it all forward to, to where we go from here, there are four key opportunity areas identified for the future. Um, to maximize impacts while using fewer resources. We're all planning um, using fewer dollars um, in our budgets. So the identified opportunities were developed to demonstrate how state agencies and the nonprofit sector can further local and regional planning needs and goals. And just giving you a few examples of, of some of our small gains that we've had since uh, producing a snapshot and, and publishing it about a year ago. Um, when talking about aligning program rules, our state legislature recently passed a bill to require municipalities to permit accessible dwelling un or accessory dwelling units, excuse me, and um, set some standards to ensure that that's consistently applied across the state. In terms of forming strategic partnerships, uh, we at National Regional Planning Commission are currently working to create the data collection and reporting portal for New Hampshire Housing's community planning grantees, where we're tying in questions on their implementation effect with our regional planning goals. Um, building technical assistance. Our State Office of Energy and Planning's annual conference used the snapshot as a source for developing local board training session ideas and sustaining engagement opportunities. Um, both the commissioners of agriculture and transportation are, are actively using the snapshot in their outreach efforts and as a guide for what citizens in New Hampshire want and need. Um, so with that, I will pass it on to our next speaker. Dazzle, if you are ready. I am ready. I don't see the ready? A little ball coming up yet, but I'm ready. Thank you, Jen. There you go. Thank okay. you. Okay. Here we go. And let me start by just saying thank you also to Joanna Nadeau for inviting me to participate in this. If I am reading our little screen correctly, it looks like we have over 200 people listening. So thank you all for uh, joining us. 
so my name is Dazzle Ekblad, and I, uh, that is my real name, by the way. Some of you may be noticing that and wondering about that. My parents were absolutely hippies. I can tell you fun stories if you're interested. Uh, but let me focus on the topic at hand. I am here today to talk about New York and the ways in which the New York State has offered support for municipalities to do sustainability planning, to focus on their energy use and shift it towards more clean sources, um, and think about climate change. So today I'm going to be talking about three different programs. So these, each of these programs has the name communities in the name, and what the real message is there is that it is focused on, each of them are, is focused on communities and on a sort of integrative uh, focus, each with slightly different emphasis, however. And you'll notice that these programs have some overlap, and some of them are complementary. Most of them are really complementary, but they have covered different time frames. So I decided to sort of give us an overview and give us a timeline to help sort of organize how these different uh, programs are related, because they do have pretty similar names. And so I work at the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, or the DEC, and I help manage the Climate Smart Communities Program. So that's the one that's sort of nearest and dearest to my heart. But it's important to recognize that the Climate Smart Communities Program is interesting and unique in that it's, a, it's an interagency effort. There are six different state agencies that sponsor it, including Health and Transportation, Department of State. But the DEC and my office, the Office of Climate Change, is one of the main kind of administrative managers and sources of uh, resources and support for the program. The other main partner that does a lot of support uh, for the program is called the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, or NYSERDA. This is basically the state's energy authority. And they launched a program in 2011 called Cleaner Greener Communities that wasn't, didn't have the same focus as Climate Smart Communities, but um, was complementary in a lot of ways. And that program just recently came to an end in 2016. And soon, uh, that same agency, NYSERDA, will be launching a program called Clean Energy Communities, which I will also talk about today. But let's start with uh, Climate Smart Communities. So Climate Smart Communities is a program that is focused on climate change and helping local governments get support uh, at no cost on a voluntary basis for looking at their energy use, their emissions, and helping them adapt to a changing climate. The program offers all sorts of decision support tools, guides, we do monthly webinars, we offer case studies um, from our foremost leading municipalities. We have a listserv where uh, we have about 11,000 members on a listserv and we offer updates on policy changes, information about upcoming educational opportunities or grant opportunities. We try to build a network of these communities where they can both share information among themselves and have a line of communication uh, with the state level to learn about new programs and opportunities. So the Climate Smart Communities Program, I think one of its defining characteristics is it really is flexible. Uh, there's assistance for whichever direction a community wants to go. As long as it's related to climate change, they can find some kind of support within the program, but then they can really chart their own way forward um, to reduce their emissions, to save money through cutting their energy use, and to really start to build resiliency in the face of climate change. And again, this is an entirely voluntary program. There are no costs um, involved for the communities to participate. So to give you a sense of what these Climate Smart Communities have done, there's a nice sort of overview on this slide. A lot of this activity especially happened between 2012 and 2015 when there were regional support contractors, real boots on the ground out across New York State. New York State is a big state with a diversity of communities, so these regional coordinators did a lot of great work to support communities in developing plans, climate action plans, doing inventories, renewable energy feasibility studies, things like that. And also there was a lot of real concrete initiatives that happened um, in energy and transportation, waste management, and there were some communities that I think were especially exceptional who did a set of vulnerability assessments and uh, resiliency planning activities along the waterfronts, um, along the Hudson River. There's a little snapshot here of the Resilient Catskill report. Village of Catskill is one of the groups who participated in a waterfront resilient task force planning process over several years where they really took a hard look at their community, its facilities like wastewater treatment plants that were right along the river and subject to sea level rise. These communities did a lot of groundwork for um, engaging uh, diversity of stakeholders and really setting out plans and goals for their future. So you can see from these achievements that Climate Smart Communities have really done efforts that have moved them both towards reducing their emissions and towards becoming more resilient in the face of a changing climate. 
to give you a sense of where these communities are in New York State, this is a map that shows the, the density. The yellow big blocks are county level governments and the smaller ones uh, and symbols are towns and villages and cities. So since the program started in 2009, we have 177 registered communities. I'll explain exactly what registered means. Um, but these communities um, represent about one-third of the population of New York State, about 6.6 .6 million people. And be aware that some of these communities are more active than others, but that's a, that's a pretty good chunk. But we clearly have a, a long ways to go to fully enroll more of these communities in this process. But we are satisfied that it's a program that has the flexibility to support the planning and sustainability and climate change efforts of communities that are as small as a couple hundred, like the village of Van Etten, or a large, highly dense uh, county like Suffolk County on Long Island. So we have 177 registered communities and seven what we call certified communities. And I'll describe a little bit more about what that means. Basically, within the Climate Smart Communities Program, we have two tiers. And the first tier is what we call a registered Climate Smart Community. And this is a community who's really They've made a commitment. They haven't necessarily implemented a lot of actions, but they've gathered enough support so that their highest body of local elected officials, like a town board, has passed a municipal resolution that adopts what we call the 10-point Climate Smart Communities Pledge. And that's basically a commitment to acting on climate change, to reducing emissions, to taking a look at vulnerabilities, and, and becoming more resilient. So in contrast, becoming a certified Climate Smart Community is a pretty high bar. These are leading communities who've really taken a close look at their situation and have done baseline studies, who've set goals, who've achieved targets, and um, they've become certified under the program by submitting documentation that verifies that they've achieved these certain um, actions. And through accumulating points, they can achieve certified bronze or silver or gold levels. This is a photo of the city of Kingston, which is one of those leading communities along the Hudson River. That's the Hudson in the background of that photo, actually. Uh, who this, this Kingston is a community who also participated in those waterfront task force resiliency uh, projects. And they have done an amazing amount of work, both on reducing their emissions and on uh, adaptation. And so they're one of our bronze level communities. And so they're one of the communities that went through this rigorous process to submit documentation and chose a pathway through this wide menu. The certification manual includes over uh, about 138 possible actions. And they accumulated enough points to become a bronze level um, community. And the certification program really is um, encompassing of a lot of different activities. It not only focuses on concrete activities like upgrades to buildings or wastewater treatment plants. It also focuses on when um, rewarding communities when they've done planning activities or put in place new policies or done outreach campaigns. So just so you have a sense of what I mean when I'm talking about certification actions, I wanted to offer this list. This is a list of what we call the priority actions. These are actions that we put forth as important for building a foundation for a successful local climate program. And you'll notice that the first few actions really are focused on building a team. I think that it's really important that local communities recognize that nothing gets done unless you have a group of committed, dedicated people. So we do a lot to support communities informing teams and, uh, and rewarding them for designing uh, collaborative efforts that engage uh, people in the community. Action 1.2, for example, we've found to be really important when a community has an active task force where they both have municipal staff, planners, uh, waste uh, water treatment plant or, you know, uh, managers or DPW type people, as well as community members. We find that there's a good balance in an interchange where those community members who might be volunteers or uh, local members of an APA chapter, perhaps, where they, if they get involved, they can help the local government uh, hold them accountable and help remind them of their priorities, and also, in some cases, simply be a volunteer who can help uh, inform them of available grants or educational opportunities. And so those task force we found to be really important. The other actions on this certification action priority list include things like setting baselines, doing uh, studies that help establish where a community is, and then setting targets and where they might want to go. So I'll quickly mention that we're excited that for 2016, we have a new set of grants. We have about $11 million that we'll be in charge of uh, awarding to communities that have put together proposals, both for uh, implementation type projects. These will be projects that will be up to $2 million of an award in size. And these would be uh, where the emphasis really is on bigger projects that might involve relocating a vulnerable facility, for example, or reducing flood risk. And then there's all 
also uh, project types under this implementation category that are related to bringing down emissions um, related to transportation or recycling of food waste. And then there's also support under this new program for communities to work towards becoming certified. And this is a program that's very focused on municipalities. Only these four types of municipalities listed here are eligible entities. However, we do encourage uh, municipalities to form regional partnerships, to um, get help from consultants, um, be part of, to be part of this program. So I'm also going to talk about a program called Cleaner Greener Communities. And this is a program that was administered by NYSERDA. It was launched in 2011. And its goals revolved around looking at land use policies and promoting uh, sustainable growth and smart growth in particular. Phase one of Cleaner Greener Communities involved the creation of 10 different regional sustainability programs. And so there was support from the state, a million dollars of support for each of these regions to put together a regional sustainability plan. These assessed um, greenhouse gases, energy use, and also did an assessment of natural resources and economic assets as well. These plans also set targets across a whole range of sectors that you can see listed here. I could talk about these plans uh, for a long time, but I want to keep moving. But these were interesting plans that included setting of goals as well. And there's been an attempt to integrate um, these plans into, for example, the Climate Smart Communities Grant Program, where communities applications will score more highly if they refer back to these plans. So there's been efforts to keep these plans relevant and keep implementing them. But I'll, I'll say in some cases that hasn't been as successful in some regions over others. Also part of cleaner, greener communities was offering grants for large-scale implementation projects, such as uh, smart growth, mixed-use, lead, ND type developments. And there were also projects, big projects that were focused on uh, rapid transit. Um, and there was even a large digester project, I believe, that was on Long Island. The other type of grants that was offered under here were, were many direct grants to communities to re-examine their comprehensive plans and integrate sustainability into them as well. So as the last section of my talk, I want to talk about a new program that is any day now should be launched. It's called Clean Energy Communities. And this is a program that's primarily going to be managed um, not out of my office, but out of NYSERDA, the New York State's Energy Authority. And we have worked closely with them to try to educate communities about how these programs are related, how, um, how climate smart communities and clean energy, program, clean energy communities really are complementary. Um, but we recognize that this is a challenge. We've had so many programs, you know, uh, clean and greener, cleaner, greener communities is the other one I mentioned that I think, unfortunately, many local governments get confused about these names that sound so familiar. So we're working hard to develop diagrams like this one that focus on, okay, these programs are related. Climate Smart Community Certification is a really comprehensive program that includes a lot of activities that are not related to energy, whereas the Clean Energy Communities Program really is focused on energy. And for communities who haven't done much sustainability work, the Clean Energy Communities Program is likely to be a good place to participate, um, to start their participation in this, because it's one of the programs where it's likely that they can get uh, cost savings right off the bat within, the, uh, within a short period of time. So the Clean Energy Communities Program has two phases, where one, a community completes four out of 10 high impact actions. And I'll show that list of high impact actions. And then step two, the real carrot here, is that by becoming a designated clean energy community, they can access grant funding that has no local cost share to support additional projects um, that will involve clean energy. Another part of the Clean Energy Communities Program that uh, we're all very excited about is across New York State and every single region of New York State, there will be regional coordinators, boots on the ground, who are directly able to assist communities as they work towards uh, bringing more renewable energy and clean energy into their communities. We find in a state that's as big as New York, you need somebody to call to sort through all of the different programs that the state offers. Here's that list of the clean energy community's 10 high impact actions. So you'll notice that there's a, there's a range, and they aren't all focused directly on energy. There are some actions related to transportation, the clean fleets, and electric vehicles, for example. And also notice that uh, the Climate Smart Community Certification is included in this uh, list of 10 high impact actions. This is a way for the two programs to be integrated and to also reward the communities who have already achieved uh, certification. The other way in which these two programs, Clean Energy Communities and Climate Smart Communities, are integrated 
are is that um, many of the actions that are part of the Climate Smart Community Certification Manual are covered by these 10 high impact actions you see on the screen here. So the idea is that local governments can simultaneously work toward being designated both as a clean energy community and a certified climate smart community. Um, and we recognize that planning out a process like this can be complex and so uh, those regional coordinators will be in place to both help communities navigate through becoming a clean energy community and hopefully more communities becoming a, a certified climate smart community. So thank you for your time and attention. Um, I will now pass on presenter over to Alicia. Alicia, are you there? Sorry, just getting the... Uh, da -da. Are you, you seeing the right view? Okay. Yes, we are. In the right view? Okay, great. Oops. So, hi, I'm Alicia Hunt. I am the Director of Energy and Environment in the City of Medford, Massachusetts. Um, in, Med in Massachusetts, I'm going to talk about a couple of different programs that we have here. Um, one of the things that I've noticed, particularly as listening to our other speakers, is that in Massachusetts, some of the programs, sustainability, are aimed more for engineering departments, some are for planning departments, some are for energy managers. We have a lot of um, communities with energy managers in Massachusetts. My title is Director of Energy and Environment. I'm a planner by training, and I am essentially the equivalent of, an, of a sustainability director here in the city. So just to place you, Medford is just outside of Boston. We're five miles north of Boston, so we're part of the metro Boston area. Um, we are a very dense population, but we also have state forest up in the top third of our city as well. So we kind of have a little bit of everything here. One of our claims to fame is that we are the fourth English settlement in North America, but that also means that we have some pretty old building stock as well as brand new stuff. And we have Tufts University here and they're a great partner to work with. <clears throat> So I was going to frame this by touching on some of the stuff we've done here in Medford. Back in the late 90s, we did a greenhouse gas inventory, created a municipal climate action plan. Those were both inspired by the organization ICLE, which is an international organization for cities working on climate issues. Um, then they created an Office of Energy and Environment, which became my office here in the city. And actually, our first director of energy and environment, she was the person who had done our greenhouse gas inventory, had created the climate action plan, and eventually actually went on to leave here and work for ICLE. Um, but she also formed our Clean Energy Committee, which was our first resident volunteer group working on uh, sustainability type issues. The Clean Energy Committee is a formal committee of the city, and the members are appointed by the mayor. We then moved into another phase. Now, don't get me wrong, we have done energy efficiency type projects throughout the history of Medford, but you don't have time for that. Um, in 2009, people may be familiar with the federal government's energy efficiency community block grants. That was a big kickstarter for us here in Medford because to kick us into high gear. As part of that, we got funding to hire an energy efficiency coordinator, which was a part-time coordinator. And in fact, that was my job um, when I first started here in the city. And when I started, I was told, your first job here is to get us designated as a green communities. We want to be one of the first. Um, so I have, I'm going to talk some more about the green communities designation process and grant process in a subsequent slide. We then have actually very strong regional planning organizations, and so in 2012, our climate action plan was now 11 years old. We worked with a regional planning agency to create a local energy action plan. Our climate action plan in 2001 was very centered on greenhouse gases that we could control. It was municipal buildings, municipal fleet. The local energy action plan actually acknowledged the fact that most of our greenhouse gases are not municipal, actually that's only 4%, but really it's residential and commercial that we need to be addressing. And so it helped us start to look at more uh, citywide programs that we could do. 
In 2014, we started to move into resiliency, adaptation, really thinking about how climate change is going to impact us and less about reducing our greenhouse gases. The way I tend to explain it to my mayors is that at this time, reducing greenhouse gases is expected. It's necessary. It's something we're doing. If we want to be cutting edge and working on the, the most latest things, we need to be looking at resiliency and adaptation to our changing climate. We, um, we also were very responsive to grant programs and state and federal programs. As many of you know, I believe most of you work for municipalities, um, but municipalities need to be responsive to the fact that we are funded by taxpayers. We are originally a blue collar community here in Medford. We're now very, very diverse. We have 68 different birth countries represented in our high school. But still, we need to be responsive to the fact that while we have to do the right thing, we have to be fiscally responsible about it, which is part of why we tend to be very responsive to state and federal grant opportunities. Uh, the Resiliency Technical Assistance Implementation Grant, and I will be talking about that in a few minutes. I have some slides on that as well. Um, the Boston Metro mayors were convened by our regional planning agency, and we've created a task force to look at resiliency and adaptation. We sent the UN Compact of Mayors and recently began working on a vulnerability assessment. So to touch on a few of those things in a little more detail. The Green Communities Act was passed in 2008 here in Boston at the same time as the Global Warming Solutions Act, which you may be seeing getting some press uh, these days. The state got sued for not uh, abiding by the Global Warming Solutions Act. But the Green Communities Act was more focused on communities. Its DOER is our Department of Energy Resources. And that had a green communities division created within it. And for regional coordinators, uh, we work closely with our regional coordinators. And they pr this created this program. And it also created the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which is a carbon uh, selling and trading scheme, which actually finances a lot of the other programs that, that they put out. To be a green community, um, there are five criteria. So I apologize for the abbreviations, but um, you had to adopt as of right siting for renewable energy or alternative energy generation, research and development, or manufacturing. And you had to have an expedited, expedited permitting process for those things so that it wouldn't take a long time to get those, the renewable energy up and running. We were asked to create an energy reduction plan. Now, this reduction plan was about municipal energy use. It was only asking us to make a plan to reduce greenhouse gases that we had direct control over. As you can see, this is a 2010 program. Uh, purchasing fuel efficient vehicles, and then the stretch code. So everybody has to abide by a building code. In Massachusetts, it has energy requirements. And in Massachusetts, they created what they call the stretch code, which is a more, it's a stricter energy code for buildings. And municipalities would adopt that. And then a builder would either build to the base code or to this more strict energy code based on what community he's building in. And then it provides grants for energy efficiency projects and renewable energy projects. The grants are set up so that when you are de first designated, you automatically get a grant. Um, the grant is $250,000. You just have to have an energy efficiency program project that the state approves. And then after that, there are annual competitive grant rounds that once your previous grant is completely finished and all your paperwork is in, you may then apply for an additional competitive grant. So we have gotten several competitive grants, and we've been doing projects like hot water heater upgrades, oil to gas heating conversions, upgrading indoor and outdoor LED, and weatherization of municipal buildings. So these have all been focused around buildings that we own and control, because it's towards getting down our municipal energy usage at that 20%. In order to abide by the stretch code, Developers have to have HERS ratings performed, which basically means they end up with a score for buildings that are for 
residential units or smaller, and they get submitted to me. And one of the things that I have noticed is that those scores have been getting gradually better over the years since we have passed that, not because they've been required to get better, they've just been getting better. And so I really appreciate that, and I think the stretch code is making a real difference. We've been also, you've all heard the adage, you can't reduce what you don't measure. So we have to measure energy, municipal energy, and they provide us with a tool to do that. So then um, regionally in Massachusetts, we have very strong planning uh, agencies. In my area, it's the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. They provide support on a full range of planning topics. They have grants. They provide staff to help us. They provide coordination, regional procurements. They've done regional procurements on LED street lights and all kinds of things. They were the ones that had the grant for our local energy action plan and served as the consultants for that. They also convened the Boston Metro Mayors Coalition. And that is extensive support around sustainability and climate vulnerabilities. One of the very useful things of the Metro Mayors Coalition is that while this is a regional planning effort, we've got the state coming to the table. Uh, our State Department of Energy Resources, the State Department of Transportation, our Massachusetts Water Resource Authority, the agency that manages our dams, they all come to our meetings regularly, as does the EPA, which makes this a very valuable tool and is allowing us to look at both our local vulnerability issues, but also to understand regional things. In my city, there is a dam that is not in my city. It is controlled by the state. And if that dam has problems, we will have flooding. So then the Community Clean Energy Resiliency Initiative. This is a fascinating program that the state did. This was in response to Hurricane Sandy. Uh, Hurricane Sandy hit New York at high tide. It was bad. It was devastating. Boston has been very shell-shocked by that as well, because if it had hit here at high tide, we would have been much more severely um, devastated than we were. So if the timing had been slightly different, or if it had been slightly further north, it would have been very significant. So the state said, what can we do? And they said, we want our municipalities to be able to keep their buildings critical infrastructure to have electricity for two weeks of power outages. And they came to a meeting of our regional energy managers and they said, we've got this great grant, we're gonna have $40 million, and we want you to submit your shovel-ready projects for your off-grid infrastructure. And we looked at them and we said, that's brilliant, we're not ready. They said, that has never been cost-effective. We don't have shovel-ready projects. We we're not prepared to apply for this grant opportunity, which, by the way, we think is wonderful. And so they went away, and they came back a month later, and they said, OK, you can apply for the grant with your shovel-ready project. And they got actually six applications. Or you can apply for technical assistance, and we will help you start to develop these projects. And we said, great, give us this program. Um, they actually had 27 communities request the technical assistance, and it was a little more than they were actually ready for and they could handle. So we, we did some, some uh, technical assistance looking at possible projects, and the results that we got, a number of my peers said, this is not enough to apply for an implementation grant. I can't do it. And this is a lesson I want other state people who work in municipalities to take away. I turned around and I said to my state contact, this is not enough information. I can't apply for this grant with the information that the technical assistance has provided me. And they said to me, we know. Please apply anyhow. They really wanted these grants out before the current governor uh, ended his term at the end of 2014. So they said, OK, as long as you understand this, then I'm going to need more technical assistance if I apply for this implementation grant. Well, I got the grant on December 31st of 2014. And it was based on a formula. I got $833,000 from Medford to do solar with battery storage at two locations. But I said, we're still not ready, you know. And actually, the state took, it took a full year of reviewing the contract. We spent all of 2015 working on the contract. And now in 2016, the state has, in fact, hired more technical assistance for the implementation awardees. And we are still working on the planning end of this. 
our current governor thinks it's really important that we look at this resiliency, but they understand that this is new, what we're trying to do and what we're trying to do in municipalities. So they are continuing to work with us. And I think it's very important for states to realize or for municipalities to realize that you can communicate with your state offices about what they're offering and what you need to try and come to a solution that works for both. In my last few minutes here, I'm going to quickly mention the Coastal Resilience Grant Program. I have to offer the disclaimer that while we used to be coastal, we used to have seawater all the way up into Medford and Tides. We don't, and we are not considered coastal by the state. A couple of us uh, communities in this situation are arguing with the state that we're about to be coastal again. Um, there are 78 eligible municipalities. They have eligible areas in vulnerability, risk assessment, communications, looking at their ordinances, looking at retrofit, redesigns, engineering infrastructure, green infrastructure for coastal protection. If you need it to be more resilient on the coast, then this is the grant opportunity to apply for. And the grants last year ranged from 60,000 to 300,000, although you could go up to 500,000. I want to leave you with these closing thoughts in that in this field, resiliency and sustainability, you really need departments to work together. The planners, the engineers, sustainability directors. I talk to my city engineer constantly. We apply for grants together. It's very important that we're on the same page for these things. We also need to work together as regions in order to make this stuff work, that we all have similar issues as our surrounding communities. I know my peers very well, and we provide each other with information whenever we can. I recommend the Urban Sustainability Directors Network as a source of networking for other sustainability directors, and the Association of Climate Change Officers as an organization that does a lot of training in climate change and sustainability. Thank you, and I am going to turn this over to Donna. Uh, let's see. Uh, sorry, it's uh, getting my mouse over here. There we go. Donna, correct? There we go. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. And uh, I think we've heard some really great examples of presentation of, uh, um, from the other speakers today. And I want to thank uh, APA for inviting me to join it. What I'm going to talk about is the types of resources and information that we provide to communities in New Jersey uh, through what we call the Sustainable Jersey Program. And what we've learned with working with municipal governments, um, you know, and in New Jersey we have quite a number of them, is that they really uh, need to understand fundamentally what sustainability is and then how, what the best path forward is for them. So we talk about sustainability and, and we focus the resources that we provide for them or link them up to um, through the lens of uh, people, prosperity, planet. So we are a comprehensive uh, sustainability uh, implementation program. So the way we support and drive change in our local governments in New Jersey is by using certification as a framework for change. Um, what we found with our communities and, and all you that are local practitioners throughout the U.S. understand is that while we all aspire, um, to address this, the broad range of sustainability issues from climate change and resiliency, to energy planning, to uh, local economies and, and creative communities and equity issues. It's very hard um, sometimes to articulate why it's important to our elected and appointed officials and to get the funding and resources behind that to get the staff resources to make a difference. So with that in mind, the Sustainable Jersey Program, which was developed in partnership with our state league of municipalities, really had that um, elected official kind of um, client in our, in our mind as we were developing our program. So the way our program supports and provides resources and drives change to communities is through this certification model, we identify actions that can help municipalities. And actually, most recently, we added schools to our program. And then most importantly, um, when we discuss the tools, resources, and guidance that we um, provide to our community, we often are, are doing that in ways that are sometimes just repackaging existing programs that are already out there and including them in our certification model 
so that we're sure our local governments are aware that these programs and benefits and funding resources exist. And then we also directly provide grants, um, but also, like I said, link communities to funding um, resources that are available from state and federal sources. We also want to think about um, ways that we can um, support sustainability initiatives in our communities from all different levels of drivers for change. Uh, our elected and appointed officials are really important, but often I'm sure those that are involved with local government understand that the boards and commissions and volunteers, as well as the non-governmental organizations and sometimes state agencies, really do have the ability to help support and drive the change in our community. So that part of the, the thread of our program is to try and link those resources together so that communities can effectively um, move forward with addressing sustainability. Um, just for some context, New Jersey does have 500 and, oh, I need to update this slide, 565 municipal governments. We actually, in the first time in history, had two municipalities merge. Uh, Princeton Township and Princeton Borough are now Princeton. Um, but what that means is that we, if we're trying to drive sustainability change at a local government level, we need to understand what are the policy and programmatic drivers that we can influence. So uh, all land use planning does occur at the local level in New Jersey. There's a lot related to energy and municipal buildings and facilities, you know, solid waste and recycling, all those types of, of areas are where local governments have the ability to make progress if they have the right resources and guidance. Um, we also had to be aware of the, the great diversity in the types of municipalities we have in New Jersey when we're developing and, and right-sizing programs and actions that we'd like them to um, engage with. When we have, you know, our smallest community is actually, well, our smallest one I think is 17 people. But when we have very small communities to very large communities, we really need to think about their ability to be successful and move forward. The um, program where it is now, um, we are thrilled that we have 78% of all our local governments in New Jersey have signed up and are participating in our program. And we do cover 88% of the po population in the state. But I think most importantly, out of those 437 municipalities that have registered, uh, we've certified um, 193 in our Sustainable Jersey program. Um, 160 at the entry level, bronze level, and 33 at the silver. Um, and right now, we are currently, our staff um, is reviewing applications from 111 municipalities that are seeking certification. And with this program, it is free and voluntary for our local governments to be involved with. Uh, and, um, you know, it is, um, an, their certification only lasts for three years. So um, communities that are making progress in, in things like reducing their greenhouse gas or doing Energy Star portfolio and tracking and monitoring their changes in greenhouse gas, um, our program really has been able to um, voluntarily uh, incentivize communities to track and monitor their energy efficiency and conservation uh, programs, for example, uh, because we award them points for those types of activities. The way we drive that change in our communities is that we make sure that our local governments have a commitment. As we heard earlier with a couple of the other previous speakers, and especially from the last one, um, if we aren't sure, if our communities don't have a commitment from their uh, local governing council um, to drive and support a, a program, these programs and activities are in for the long, long haul, like we heard about from Bedford. Um, you know, this isn't something most of our communities get into one year and out the next. We, we strive and our, our goal is to get communities to embed these practices, programs, and policies into their operations. So we really do need to figure out how to institutionalize change. And the way we do that is making sure the municipality is committed to it, that they create a local team, and then they start to think about what types of actions they are going to uh, address the related to sustainability, submit the documentation, and then after it's reviewed uh, and verified, we um, provide them with our certification. The local role and the way that communities get access to resources really is by having an organized leadership team, which we call the green team. Um, these are critical because 
what we're finding actually it's interesting with our schools program, which is just ramping up, is that um, unless communities are very very well organized and have a central point of contact and a and a group or a body that's taking the issue of sustainability um, as their mandate. Um, often grants and resources and funding is not optimized because they don't have anyone to act on it. So we know that these green teams are critically important. Within the program, um, we, um, we have actions that um, um, go across a broad cross-section. Uh, you know, we talk about people, prosperity, planet, but from a planning perspective, you'll note that um, we have what we call priority actions. And most of these are the types of entry level activities that we know municipal governments can and should be focusing on. Um, and some of them are in here because of the kind of political policy issues, and some of them are here because of the critical um, you know, uh, sustainability kind of um, mandate. So, you know, we want our municipal governments to be thinking about energy tracking, management, um, climate adaptation, um, you know, issues about diversity in their community. So our program does kind of segregate our actions into two different categories. One are just normal actions and those other ones that are priority actions. The way we guide and, do, and provide resources is that, for example, if we're asking the municipality to think about how they can be an um, EV, or electric vehicle um, friendly community and what types of ordinances and modifications they need to do to their uh, permitting and their approval process and their inspection process. Um, you know, we don't just ask them to think about that as a best practice. We say, here's an ordinance, here's a handbook, um, here's the way to go forward and do it. Um, similarly, if we want communities to adopt um, a climate action plan, or a sustainability plan or any of these types of things, our program gives examples and guidance to help them move forward with it. If we want communities to do policies related to energy conservation um, and green purchasing, again, we, uh, through our program, work with other partners and state agencies and organizations to develop recommendations and best practices that we then ask our municipalities. And they choose from a list of about 190 actions that they uh, move forward with and, and adopt. Um, we are really lucky in New Jersey under the renovation and retrofit of facilities and building. Our state clean energy program has a tremendous amount of resources that are available for our local government. But um, again, like I mentioned earlier, they weren't, weren't taking advantage of them. Um, you know, just a little framing around it right now with the 100 and, um, 60 municipalities that have entered at this bronze level. We do know that most of them have focused on a broad brush of, of sustainability related issues, um, but we, we have been successful in um, incentivizing and encouraging a, an ever increasing number of our municipalities to do their energy audits, to create a comprehensive plan for implementation of that energy audit recommendation. Um, and we're really pleased that we've been able to kind of drive change and get communities to use our state's clean energy program. Um, we only have 33 municipalities that have uh, earned our silver certification because it really does mean they're adopting a lot of the great programs that we heard about that are in some of the other states um, that were on the call today. And you know, communities have to really step up and provide additional resources, either it be staff, uh, direct funding from the municipal governments to move forward. The um, program supports success by providing, for example, when we ask communities to consider using Energy Star Portfolio Manager to um, track and monitor their energy use in their municipality, we make sure that uh, we do webinars in partnership with US EPA on the Energy Star Portfolio Manager. Uh, we have a staff person that can help them set up their, their uh, online portfolio and help them with questions related to it. So the program while we provide the basic guidance on our website and information, it's really important, um, we recognize, to support communities in making progress in their sustainability and issues by having a really robust training program and technical assistance program as well. Um, and it, it, that's really why we think we can um, you know, see the large number of communities that are making progress around sustainability issues. 
we talk to our communities about, uh, you know, why should they dedicate staff resources to a free and voluntary program, um, their, their community capital and time to getting certified, you know, what is in it for them. And, um, you know, what we found is that while um, we ourselves have some grant programs, which I'll talk about in a moment, we do know that municipalities respond to that virtual competition of wanting to outgreen their neighboring municipality and mayor, and that creating, you know, all of the certification models we've heard about and the ways to drive change uh, in our communities, that's a really good way to um, help communities recognize and celebrate their, their success and accomplishments. Through our program directly, we've been able to give out over $2 million in grants, which really pales in comparison to, to some of the grant programs that we just heard about from Massachusetts and New York. But these are private funds that we were able to raise to give to communities to address sustainability issues. So, you know, almost nine years ago, for example, we were proud to be able to have funded one of the first, um, or I guess it was more seven years ago, the electric vehicle charging stations in a few of our municipalities. And now, um, as of a few weeks ago, actually, uh, last week at our sustainability summit, our state agency finally announced a program to fund um, electric vehicle charging stations in municipal governments and businesses in New Jersey. So, um, you know, when we're going to drive change and support communities around sustainability, we really do need to think about um, the way to link private philanthropic money um, to state agency funding that's available to, to support sustainability initiatives. The broad brush of planning focus areas that we ask our communities to consider um, adopting as an action as part of their certification are really very robust and cover all the areas that we uh, spoke about today, along with some other areas where we're driving, we're seeking to drive change. So, um, you know, within the land use and transportation realm, um, pretty much any, everything um, that most planners think about and we do kind of with our bread and butter uh, of planning around open space and farmland preservation and, and master planning elements and, you know, pedestrian training, uh, bike and ped plans. Um, we also are asking communities to and, and think about how to start doing uh, a modification to all their plan elements to look at all health and all policies. Uh, we want communities also to look at economic development. So planning focus areas related to creative placemaking plans and asset mapping um, to drive and identify resources and that um, not only fit into our resiliency suite of work, but also our economic development suite of actions in our program. And then, of course, we have the, the very, uh, very important uh, climate action plans, energy master plans, and, and municipal carbon footprint. And we're actually um, entering into a, a new re uh, suite of actions related to infrastructure assessment and um, for resiliency and adaptation. We do have a very robust resiliency program, um, which is here to support our communities. Uh, they provide technical assistance and training. They've done a, a whole host of uh, tool development that supports communities as they're assessing their vulnerability. Um, some of the really interesting programs that we have out there are, is our coastal vulnerability assessment um, that um, helps communities assess the risk of climate adaptation, I mean of climate change and sea level rise. And for our coastal communities, we actually have worked in partnership with a bunch of other state agencies or organizations to come up with a climate adaptation flooding risk tool where uh, key municipal assets are identified uh, and communities are worked through a planning exercise to really start prioritizing how to deal with some of those issues. And, and develop a robust adaptation framework. So we are pleased to be able to, to move into this area with some specialized funding that we have uh, through some federal grants and working with some other partners. The last thing I just want to cover um, really briefly is that, you know, as we've heard today, there is a great number of sustainability initiatives going on uh, throughout the U.S. Um, the, and um, about a year and a half ago, um, the Sustainable Jersey program, uh, through a grant that we got through the CERDNA Foundation, started to do an inventory of what are the statewide sustainability programs that relate to either energy or the broad brush of sustainability uh, areas that exist across the United States. And is there something that we can learn from these programs 
And as importantly, is there something that all of the, our programs together can learn from one another? So we did um, create a statewide sustainability report. And you can see the link on the website if you're interested in um, seeing that program. And what we did is, um, you know, you can see the great partners in here, like Minnesota Green Steps. We have our partners from New York State and Connecticut and Massachusetts. Um, work, great work that's going on in Michigan. Uh, um, the Green Tier Legacy Program. I mean, it's amazing the programs that are out there and the space that we were looking at is where we're either a state and agency, a nonprofit, or an academic partner was seeking to drive change through a certification or a rating program process to work with multiple, uh, or that was available to all communities in their state. And so uh, we are in the process of exploring the uh, um, and, and establishing a national network of the statewide uh, certification or, or, or rating program. And I just encourage you to we'll, we'll keep you posted on where that goes because our goal is to really see if we can expand the number of states that are um, seeking to drive change in their local government uh, by creating a framework of, around sustainability. So that, uh, oh, and this is just one of the graphics. I sorry, I thought I had one more slide. Um, that really kind of just gives a little bit an idea about the numbers of government units and the numbers that are participating. But when all is said and done, the reality is there's great work going on throughout the United States, and we really hope to um, get this statewide network. We're going to be having another convening of the 12 states um, later this fall. Ooh, now I'd like to turn it over to um, back to Joanne, and she, I think, has a few uh, questions for us, and is going to open it up to questions. Great, I'm happy to do that. Um, as long as Christine doesn't have anything for us, we'll just dive right in. And thanks to everybody who's out there listening. You've been um, listening for a long time, and now we're going to try to shift it a little bit more into conversation mode. Um, for any of you that do have questions, you can submit them through the panel on the, well, on the right, I think, um, the webinar panel, and, and we'll answer them. Um, but just to get us started, I'll, I'll ask, ask a question out to everybody who spoke. Um, so in terms of, you know, we've, we've heard a bit about a lot of different subtleties in state and local sustainability efforts. Um, and maybe based on that, what you've heard today, or maybe just in general, uh, what do you think, and I'll let each of you go, what do you think is the biggest opportunity for improving your state's sustainability efforts? Um, so anybody can jump in. Or I'll start calling on you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I'll, this is Donna. I'll jump in right away, um, even though I just finished talking. I think one of the biggest things is that, um, from our perspective in New Jersey, is to continue to integrate uh, programmatic resources that are available at our state agencies and with our federal agencies. Um, and nonprofit organizations and technical assistance providers, for, for example, are, we work extensively with our transportation management agencies um, to help guide and direct resources to local governments. Um, so I think you know one of our big challenges ongoing is that you know how do we continue to make sure that we're capturing and and um, making our uh, our communities aware of the great resources that are out there because there's not enough time, money, or energy to reinvent the wheel. And if a resource is out there, we want our communities to be directed um, easily toward it. Um, and so that's one of the things that we continue to focus on. I could build on that. Um, this is Dazzle Ekblad from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. I agree with Donna, because I, I think the first thing that comes to mind for me is a real need to help communities and local governments really think in systems, really see how these different sectors are connected, how what we do with our, our vehicles and what we do with our water and our use of resources and energy has impacts in other sectors. And I think we uh, have built a lot of uh, structures within government that are separate silos. And so I think that there's a real need for um, an educational effort that really reaches from the grassroots all the way up to the tippy top through our state governments and through the federal government to sort of help um, 
educate everyone about those interconnections and to help those local communities start to see the benefits of integrating um, concerns about climate change and sustainability ideas into their routine decision making so that these kinds of issues are not seen as something extra or something separate from their everyday tasks and so that it's seen as something that's achievable and that they can learn about those resources that are available like Donna is saying I think there there's still largely a real lack of information um, among communities who they might be interested in this but sometimes it's really hard to figure out how to move forward hey this is Jen I, I would you know again just build on what um, both Dazzle and Donna have just said and for us I think it's kind of taking that collective impact approach um, and, and really relying upon our partnerships that we have um, we in New Hampshire are obviously a small state and both in geography and in population and so just that ability to um, partner with one another really helps us to maximize the benefits um, and, and potential impact that we can offer to communities and really make um, what we have go significantly further. So this is Alicia and while I absolutely agree with all of them and I was going to use words like silos, I'll throw out another idea and that's that state programs um, in Massachusetts have been targeted at individual communities and in um, my region we have developed a uh, regional partnership that's working together and we do have state agencies that come and participate in it but to think about maybe there needs to be some state planning grants for regions to work together and look at regional issues together some support to, to pull some of that together we're great that we have this support from our area and the Metropolitan Area Planning Council actually found private support in the Bar Foundation to help pull our regional program together but to consider the idea that doing more regional and uh, uh, inspiring regional collaboration with grants is a good idea. Great. Okay, well, I'll pose another question unless Christine breaks in and says we have something from the audience. Um, uh, I'm wondering what you all would say a big or, you know, a major challenge is that local governments face when they try to incorporate sustainability into their planning and operations. This is Jen. I'm just going to, I'm going to kind of talk about our challenges but piggybacking off of what Alicia said is an oper you know is an opportunity in Massachusetts they've got a lot of money for municipalities to do their work we don't um, and one of the things that kind of precipitated the work that the nine regional planning commissions in New Hampshire did along with the work that New Hampshire housing did was the simple fact that New Hampshire doesn't have funding for municipal planning and so we have 234 different municipalities and planning boards trying to go it alone. Um, and so you know, we, as the regional planning commissions, do the best that we can to, to provide those resources and support that they need, but um, you know, can always go a lot for, further. We look at our neighbors who, who do have the grant funding for their municipalities and, and kind of drool with a little bit of envy. So, so that's one of our big challenges is just the simple lack of, of financial resources for planning in New Hampshire. This is Dazzle. I'll offer some thoughts on this as well. Um, I think in my work with local governments, I think one of the best places to start that I think unfortunately often gets overlooked is that idea of sort of a, of a needs assessment because I think communities sometimes don't know where to start and sometimes um, investing resources and time into something like just establishing core sort of a baseline of where are we at, what do we need, where are our strengths, what are our weaknesses, what are we vulnerable to, those kinds of questions are really important to start with and that's fundamentally a planning process and kind of a survey process and a characterization of a, of a region or a locality and I think there isn't enough really overt uh, support for that kind of work. So one trap that I want that it's important for municipalities to not fall into is the idea that oh we have somebody who's doing that. So what I see in a lot of municipalities in Massachusetts, we have big ones and they have lots of staff. But on the smaller ones, they say oh, it's 
Alicia's job to do sustainability. So then when I say to other department heads, oh, there's training on climate change, they don't make time for it because they figure I've got it handled. And while that's a wonderful compliment, the reality is that we need all the departments in all the municipalities to have some base level awareness of how things are changing and what they need to be preparing for, um, to have DPW commissioners understand that just preparing for storms they've seen in the past is not necessarily good enough um, is very important and how that we can overcome that idea that everybody has their own job and they do it and come to this idea that actually we all need to work together on solutions and how do we make that culture change in communities. That's great. I think this is Donna. I think, you know, um, the biggest challenge is, you know, we actually see it even in the very large municipalities like Newark down to our very small ones. Um, they all have their challenges and they don't really have enough funding time or resources. And, and I think there's only three municipalities in New Jersey that have someone whose job is um, focusing on sustainability. So really that, you know, it is that, that challenge of making it um, understood and kind of the normal operations that it's everyone's responsibility um, to think about sustainability within their, their uh, respective work and area. The other thing that um, we see as a challenge, although I think we started to overcome it, um, you know, we still haven't tackled effectively the regional issue and how do we, um, you know, support communities on a regional basis because you know, municipal government is the, the premier planning um, scale in New Jersey. But, you know, we have started to support our communities uh, to have better communications and collaboration by uh, recognizing that there's a social side to sustainability work and doing this over the long term. So we've started working by creating hubs, uh, regional hubs, that bring the state agencies, the county governments that have some level of resources, the NGOs, and the partners together to kind of showcase um, the resources um, in a, you know, very personal and, and fun setting um, so our communities can make progress. But it's still a, still a challenge. We don't have enough resources to do that all over the state yet. Donna, was that hugs or hubs? Hub. <laughs> well, I'd like to give them all hugs, but we call them <laughs> regional hubs, H-U-B-S. You know, they're a, you know, we're, they're a collaborative um, network where we invite all the municipalities that are involved in the Sustainable Jersey program um, we usually have quarterly meetings, and they end up being kind of part green team, I mean green drinks, part training, part networking, part mentoring, peer build, you know, peer relationship building, um, and it's really, really been successful in some, really in some of the more rural parts of our state um, to help build the capacity of the staff and advocates and sustainability champions that are out there. So that's that's one way that we've kind of overcome this kind of um, inertia at a municipal level to move forward or this fear of not being the leader um, because you want to make sure your neighbor's doing it as well. Well, in some ways, Donna, that was the perfect lead-in to um, a comment I wanted to make, which was that that's really the point of this, uh, well, this webinar, but, but more broadly, this regional sustainability network for the Northeast that we, we've wanted to put together. And, um, you know, the, the chance to compare notes and to motivate each other to keep going um, and to learn from each other. And I just want to put out uh, to those that are interested, we will be having our next Regional Sustainability Network call in July. Um, haven't scheduled it yet, but it'll be in mid-July. And if anyone is not getting notices from me, this is Joanna, getting notices from me about those, um, you can email me or call me. I noticed my, my email isn't on here. That's my fault there. It's um, just joanna at auduboninternational.org and I will add you to that list. And then we'll be doing another webinar um, from this Northeast Regional Sustainability Network in September and that's still coming together as well. But, but you know, the more we have these conversations um, at the local level, at the regional level, state level, and at the regional sort of multi-state level, um, I think the better off we'll all be. Okay, well, thank you everyone for joining us. This is Christine, um, and uh, we've, we've hit our 2.30 mark, so we'll just go ahead and uh, close up shop for the day. 
Um, thank you to uh, Joanna and Alicia, Dazzle, Donna, Jennifer for joining us for the New York Upstate Chapter of APA for hosting today. Um, and uh, if anyone has any questions about anything, you can um, uh, head over to our webcast webpage at ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. Thanks, everyone, and we will hear from you next time. Thanks, Christine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.